Welcome to episode number five of Swift by Sandel Swift Clips, a series of shorter videos about Swift tips and techniques. On this episode, we'll take a look at the role of controllers within the MVC design pattern. MVC is one of the most commonly used design patterns when building apps on Apple's platforms and divides most of our app's objects into three main categories, models, views, and controllers. Generally speaking, you could say that models are representations of our app's data, while our views is what makes up our UI, and our controllers is how we implement our app's logic. On this episode, we'll focus on the controller layer. Now, within Apple's flavor of MVC, there's a special type of controller that plays a very central role, and that is view controllers. View controllers are used across both iOS and the Mac and other platforms and are really central in order to create most of our app's UI when using frameworks like UIKit and AppKit. But even though view controllers are so incredibly common, there's a lot of debate around what's their ideal role within an application. Now, if we just look at the name, view controller, it kind of tells us that view controllers are controlling views. They're responsible for managing an instance of a view. Each view controller has a view did load method, which gets called by the system when it's time for the view controller to create its view. The view controller is then responsible for configuring and setting up that view until it's time to display it to the user. At which point the system will call the view will appear method to tell the view controller that the view is about to appear on the screen. The view will then remain on screen and the user will keep interacting with it until it eventually disappears and ultimately gets removed from the view hierarchy and deallocated from memory. Now this circle here is commonly referred to as the view lifecycle. It's the cycle that each view goes through from when it gets created until it gets removed and eventually deallocated. But there's many more things that tend to happen to a view and a view controller besides these three method calls. First of all, a view controller often has to construct multiple views and form a hierarchy of them, and to also define a layout for that hierarchy. Then, while the view is on screen and being displayed to the user, all sorts of different events tend to happen. Those can be user input, it can be updates to data and models, and it can also be system events that the view controller needs to handle one way or another. And even when the view is not actively being displayed on screen, different events can still happen. Things like background events can come in, and the system can also issue memory warnings that our view controllers might need to respond to. So just controlling and managing a single view hierarchy can be quite a lot of work and require a fair amount of logic. However, one common problem that a lot of developers face when using view controllers on Apple's platforms is that they tend to not only contain this type of logic, but also many other types of logic as well. Things like networking or JSON decoding, caching data, performing model updates and navigation are just some of the tasks that are very, very often handled by view controllers. And if you combine this with all of the other tasks that we looked at before when it came to managing the view lifecycle, we often end up with an implementation that can be described as a massive view controller. A view controller that becomes really large and has a huge line count because it ends up taking on too many responsibilities. Now, this is the point where a lot of articles and tutorials and conference talks will say something like, MVC doesn't scale. Now, I don't think that's true at all, and although there are many other great design patterns to pick from when it comes to building apps for Apple's platforms, MVC is also a really great choice. So what it really comes down to is that we don't necessarily need to change our app's design pattern in order to improve its architecture, we can simply use MVC in a slightly different way. One thing that's really interesting about the massive view controller problem is that we don't tend to have similar problems within our view or model layers. And the reason for that is that we tend to naturally divide our views up into smaller building blocks. We use many different kinds of views to render each screen or feature within our app. It's very rare to find a screen that consists of just one single view. We tend to use many different ones like image views and labels and table views, etc., to construct our UI. 
And the same thing is also true for models. Even within just a single feature of our app, we can often find many different kinds of models. For example, if we're building some kind of profile screen, we might have a user model and different settings that the user has, and the user might have contacts that they are messaging with, and so on and so forth. But we still then have a tendency to, even though we have these more finely grained objects within our model and view layer, we then still sometimes create view controllers that are just one big blob of logic. So if we could find a way to do the same thing to our view controllers as we've done to our other layers, that is, split them up into smaller pieces, then we could improve things a lot. And in this video, I want to talk about three different ways of doing just that, starting with child view controllers. Just like views, view controllers can be composed and put together to form a hierarchy. So for example, if we look at part of our profile view controller implementation, specifically how we create our header view, we can see that we currently use a plain UI view to create it, and we then set it up within our view controller and then finally add it as a sub view. Using child view controllers, what we can do instead is take this header view construction code and all of its associated logic, all of its layout code and, and all of those things and move them out into a separate view controller instead. We're going to call it header view controller in this case, and it's going to contain all of the logic required to render and manage an instance of a header view. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our profile view controller and instead of creating that header view in line within that view controller itself, we're instead simply going to create an instance of our new header view controller. We're then going to add that view controller's view to our main view. We're then going to add that view controller as a child to our profile view controller. And finally, we're going to notify that header view controller that it just moved to a new parent. Now, admittedly, these three steps that we need to do is three times as complicated as adding a subview to another view, but we can fix that using a simple extension. Here, we've simply taken those three method calls that we need to make in order to add a child view controller and implemented them as a completely reusable extension. So now we can simply call add and pass in a child view controller and it will be automatically added as a child to the current one. Really nice. But the question is, what's the benefit of using a child view controller compared to just creating a new view? And it all comes back to that view lifecycle that we took a look at earlier. View controllers get access to so many more events, like view will appear and did disappear, they can manage a view's complete lifecycle, and they also get access to all sorts of system events, which makes it possible to implement them in a more self-contained manner compared to if we just implemented them as a view. So child view controllers is a great way to split up massive view controllers into smaller building blocks when it comes to how we construct our views, their layout, their events, and so on. But that tends to be just a part of the logic that makes up our view controllers. We also tend to have quite a lot of other things going on within them as well. Here's a look at another example, again looking at that profile view controller, but here we're taking a look at a method which is private in which we load the current user. We do that by being aware of many different details that are pretty far from the view layer itself. For example, this method here needs to be aware of our app's backend endpoints, it then needs to perform networking, it needs to decode JSON, and then finally, it also renders our UI. And out of all of these four different points, it's really only the UI rendering that a view controller should be considered with, because after all, it's a controller for views. It's not a controller for networking or backend endpoints or JSON decoding. Now, if we want to stick with MVC, we don't want to move to a completely different design pattern. How can we solve this? Where can we implement this kind of logic where it still makes sense with an MVC? Now, this is where we can make use of another type of controller. Because MVC does not say that we only need to use view controllers, we can use many other controllers as well. And one such flavor of controller is logic controllers. You can think of logic controllers as kind of a logic buddy to a view controller. A view controller and logic controller work together in order to drive a piece of UI. The view controller can send commands to the logic controller, which then performs the logic for them, for example, runs networking or calls a database, and then returns a new state for the view controller to render. 
The beauty of this setup is that since the logic controller only accepts commands, performs them, and then returns the results, it can be more or less stateless. It might need to keep some state while it's actually performing those commands, but in general, it can remain mostly stateless. Now, if we're going to implement this kind of setup, we first need a way for a view controller and a logic controller to communicate. And to make that happen, we're going to implement a quite simple enum that we call view state. It's going to contain three different cases for the different states that a view controller can be in. It can either be loading, it can be presenting a given model, or something might have failed and we need to present an error. With that in place, we can start building our first logic controller, which is going to be a companion to that profile view controller we saw earlier. In fact, the first method that we've implemented on it is more or less an exact copy of that load user method that we saw earlier, only here it's called load current state, and when it's done, it calls a completion handler with a new view state of user. What's interesting here is that this logic controller can also contain all of the different dependencies that we need in order to perform our core logic. That means that we no longer need to inject those dependencies within our view controller. In fact, if we now go back to our view controller, we can see that we can already make it a lot simpler. It now just needs to keep a reference to its logic controller, and when a view event happens, for example, view will appear, it can simply call its logic controller, get the current state, and then render it. Easy as that. And the cool thing is that this kind of pattern scales really well even as we keep adding new events that we want to respond to. For example, let's say that we have a method for when the user picked a new profile image. We can do the same thing there. We can call our logic controller, pass in the image that was selected, and then the logic controller can go ahead and upload that to our server, and then call a completion handler with a new state that we then render. Now, not all of our view controller's methods will look like this as simple calls to the logic controller and then rendering a state. We will still keep all of our view related logic within our view controller, but the beauty is that we can now delegate all of our core logic that has nothing to do with our views themselves to our logic controller. So that's a quick look at logic controllers. Now let's look at a third and final flavor of controllers, model controllers. So far, all of the controllers that we've taken a look at has had a one-to-one -one relationship to a given view. A view controller controls one view, and a logic controller implements all of the logic required for that view. A model controller, on the other hand, has a one-to-one -one relationship to a model instead of a view, which can be really useful when we want to pass a model around in different parts of a code base, and when we have some models that are really central to our app's logic. For example, let's say that we're building a game and that we have a struct that represents the current player. You might have properties like the player's name and the player's score, any challenges that were received and so on. And one very common way to manage a model like this that is shared across our code base and used in many different places is to use the singleton pattern and create a static variable that can keep track of a single instance of this player type. Now, a problem with using a singleton in this case is that it gets hard to enforce any kind of rules that we might have around how this model might be mutated, because it could be mutated from literally anywhere within our code base. This is where model controllers come in. What we're going to do is that we're going to create a player model controller that's going to be initialized with a player model, which it then keeps track of. We can then implement all sorts of APIs on this model controller for mutating our model in a very uniform way. For example, here's how we could implement the logic that gets triggered whenever the current player completed a level. Here we're computing the score that the player earned while playing that level, and then we add that to the player's main score. But we can also do things like implement observation APIs and all sorts of other logic that can be useful when it comes to managing and observing an instance of one of our core models. So those are just some examples of how we can make use of controllers that are not necessarily view controllers within an app. But the question is, how does this approach compare to other kinds of design patterns in different architectures that are alternatives to MVC? Now this is something that we'll take a closer look at in future videos, but for now, let's just take a quick look at how this approach compares to the very popular pattern of using view models.
Now, as a quick recap, what view models are is that they're a way to manage a single view's state. They provide a view-specific interface to our core data models so that our views no longer need to interact with our core data models directly, they can instead just interact with that single view model. And view models often utilize two-way bindings and other kinds of reactive patterns in order to perform automatic updates and send actions to the view models. Logic controllers, on the other hand, are simply logic companions to an existing view controller, or in the case of SwiftUI, a logic controller can be used as a companion to a SwiftUI view. Logic controllers, they operate on a request response basis, which means that they are more or less stateless. They don't need to manage any state of their own because they just receive commands from their corresponding view controller or SwiftUI view. They perform those commands and return a new state. And model controllers, on the other hand, are not tied to a single view. Instead, they have a one-to-one -one relationship to a model and can be shared across multiple views. The main purpose of a model controller is to wrap some of our core data models in order to provide APIs for mutating and observing them in a more uniform way. So to wrap up this look at the controller layer of MVC, it's important to remember that each screen or feature can be implemented using any number of controllers. We don't need to use just a single controller to implement each of our app's features. And not all controllers need to be view controllers either. We can create logic controllers, model controllers, we can have networking controllers, and so on. Whatever we might need to control within our app, whatever logic we might have, we can always build a controller for that. And what all of this really boils down to is that MVC as a design pattern can scale just as well as any other design pattern. All it takes is for us to utilize a little bit of decomposition to break those massive view controllers up into smaller building blocks. I hope you found this video interesting and useful. You can find all of the sample code from this video at swiftbysundell.com slash clips slash five. On that page, you'll also find links to articles that go into much more detail around some of these topics. Thanks so much for watching.